This week, as we walk through the Bible, we're looking at the book of Ruth. It's a brilliantly told story, and it will be easy to overlook some of what the book is seeking to achieve. Some have called it a great love story, but there is little romance involved. Some would say it gets its name from the central character Ruth, yet the book begins with a prologue and ends with an epilogue that centre around Naomi. This is a story of her moving from emptiness to fullness, from barrenness to complete inheritance. Some would argue it's more of a story of Boaz and his faithfulness. Others would argue that it's a story about God and his character, yet God appears more in the background than in the foreground. Though time and time again he is acknowledged such as in Ruth 4.14, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. Before we consider what Ruth might be seeking to achieve, let's refresh our minds with the story and the background issues that help us understand what is happening. The first thing we need to look at is the background of Ruth. Naomi and Elimelech are from Bethlehem and because of a famine in the area they go to live in Moab. They have two sons, Marlon and Kilion, and after their father dies the sons marry two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. After ten years the two sons die, leaving Naomi with two daughters-in-law. Naomi resolves to return to Bethlehem as the famine has ended. She can offer no hope to her daughters-in-law and tries to persuade them to return to their own people. Orpah reluctantly agrees, but Ruth comes out with this wonderful statement of commitment we began the service with. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. They return to Bethlehem and Naomi sends her out to glean, or sends Ruth out to glean in the harvest fields. She chances upon the fields of Boaz, a distant relative of Elimelech. At the end of the harvest, Naomi sends Ruth to the threshing floor to request that Boaz fulfil the Leverite responsibility of the next of kin to marry a widow and raise a son to bear the dead husband's name. He's willing, but a nearer relative has prior right. In the climax of the story, Boaz skillfully persuades this kinsman redeemer to give up the right, and he marries Ruth. The son that is born is celebrated as a son born to Naomi. The preservation of the family line is significant, and Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David. Now, as we've recapped the story, there are two things that we need to explain. Leverite marriage and the redeeming of the land. Leverite marriage gets its name from the Latin levir, which means brother-in-law, and from it marriage with brother-in-law. Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 to 10 prescribes how a widow was to marry her brother-in-law and her first son was to carry on the name of her dead husband. If the brother-in-law was unwilling to fulfil his obligation, he would be taken to the town gate, humiliated and given the name Family of the Unsandled. You can read about it. It may sound a little strange to our ears, but carrying on the family name was a very serious business. Someone who failed to fulfil their responsibility brought dishonour to themselves. Having said all that, we know how it worked in theory. What happened in practice, we're less sure of. Genesis 38 and the story of Judah and Tamar tell the story of how Judah's son Onan would not get Tamar pregnant to honour his brother Ur and died as a result. Again, you can read about it in Genesis 38, but at the end of Ruth, we get this uh, recognition from the women of the town that they have acted in such a way uh, as happened in Genesis 38 to carry on the family name. So when you get this reference to Perez, 
Tamar and Judah, it's just recognising that story of Leverite marriage being fulfilled. There appears, though, no coherent view or practice that was worked out. So when Naomi returns with Ruth, no one has thought through whose responsibility it is to honour Elimelech and honour Marlon, Ruth's husband. Now, plenty of people have heard of Ruth's reputation. Boaz has, the reapers have, but no one has stepped forward and Naomi has to intervene. When it comes to redeeming the land, we see that when the issue is raised with the nearest kinsman redeemer, if the only issue was the redemption of the land and the price to be paid, something the land would pay for in itself in harvest to come, most people would jump at the opportunity of adding to their property portfolio. Now we've just talked about Leverite marriage and the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer to produce a son. If that was the only issue, many would have fulfilled that Leverite obligation. But in redeeming the land and having to produce a son, a son that was going to inherit the land, there was very little economic benefit to the kinsman redeemer. And worse than that, it was potentially a drain to his possible meagre resources as he raised this son and stepped into that role. That Boaz is willing to do this suggests he has sufficient economic means for any accompanying loss not to affect his future. It's why Onan is reluctant to fulfil his role in Genesis 38 and why this law appears to have lacked coherent application in the life of God's people. And I think this leads us to consider three things. The first aspect of the story we need to reflect on is God's blessing. Judges has told us the stories of various groups of people that failed to live up to the covenant commitment they had made on entering the promised land. Though some of the stories are great stories, this constant circle of apostasy, oppression, repentance and rest paint a rather depressing picture. Ruth is in stark contrast. Ruth begins in the days when the judges rule. Happening alongside is a story of a town, Bethlehem, and a people, three characters in particular, who are portrayed as loyal to God and his covenant. As a result, they're able to experience covenant blessing. This is emphasised in a number of ways. Blessing is a result of loyalty to God. Ruth is determined not to abandon Naomi, whatever the personal cost. She is the personification of faithfulness. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Ruth, this Moabitess, is a pr prepared to be faithful to God. Remember, it's in stark contrast to judges who are not faithful to God. This loyalty to God is understood as a means to being led towards blessing. It's seen in the way Boaz greets the harvesters, reflecting God's presence and blessing. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. It's seen in the way Boaz greets Ruth, who he understands, having left her own country and people, has taken refuge under the wings of God. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. This is further reflected in Boaz's own generosity and faithfulness. 
My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from there. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. All through the story, Boaz repays Ruth's faithfulness with generosity. Naomi recognises this as she declares, The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He's not stopped showing you his kindness to the living and the dead. Ruth is a story of God's blessing, God's blessing particularly when God's people are faithful in response to their covenant commitment. Now it's not only loyalty to God that leads to blessing, but loyalty also to the law, or as we've stressed, the relationship behind the law that leads to blessing. Perhaps we're to understand that at the time of the famine, Elimelech seeks life away from the promised land and the place of God's blessing. In the land of Moab, life returns to death and emptiness, perhaps encapsulated in Naomi's change of name from sweet to bitter. It's only by returning home that life can once again begin to experience God's blessing. Yet this theme of loyalty to God continues as the story unfolds. The reapers leave gleaning at the edges. And so Leviticus says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And so the reapers were faithful to the law of God. Remember? This is against the backdrop of famine, famine that has led people to leave the land, but they are still faithful to the word of God. They don't need to be told what to do. They instinctively know what is righteous. They demonstrate their loyalty to God by loyalty to his law. They were loyal to God because they were loyal to his laws when others were not. Though they may have had to live through a time of famine, they looked to God to be the source of blessing, and their eyes were on him. The second aspect of the story we need to reflect on is God's guidance. Naomi starts where the pleasant nights of life is transformed to bitterness. As the story unfolds, a transformation takes place where people are able to cry, Naomi has a son, and move to a place of rejoicing. All through this story is the underlying assumption that the goodness of God is guiding the narrative. And this guidance is underlined in the prayers of various characters, like Boaz, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. And this le- leads Naomi to declare he's not sh- stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. It captures the certainty of God's hand being over the lives of those that trust him. Yet when it comes to guidance in this story, there are no dreams, no angel visitations, no voices from heaven, no prophets declaring what needs to be done. It's all very understated. God works behind the scenes through the ordinary events of life. And it has led one commentator to marvel at what a scheming old lady lady and a nicely perfumed young woman can bring about with a little strategy. And this can be a little disconcerting for us. Can a manipulative person force their opinion or way on an individual or a church? And if they get what they want, claim that they have been divinely guided by God. We've probably all seen such abuse happen. Can they say that their origin and way of doing things is divine. Of course, we're vulnerable to such abuse. We're at the mercy of the egos of sinful men and women who can theologize their own sinful behavior. Yet the text is not to be abused in that way. 
for people to use it to uh, justify their ungodly behaviour is deeply crass. The point of the story is it's an encouragement to us all that God guides, sometimes in the most ordinary and understated of ways. God's guidance is sometimes ministered in its hiddenness. In the court history of David in 2 Samuel 9 to 20, in the story of Joseph in Genesis 33, 39 to 50, God is in control of the events of life, even when they're routine and mundane or contra to what might be expected. Though we might like a spectacular theophany, a God moment, a divine revelation by angel or booming voice or prophetic word, sometimes it's in the imperceptible, the seemingly natural that God guides. It's in the mundane. As we look back, we see how God has been present and his hand has faithfully blessed those that have committed their way to God and done what pleases him. God's hidden guidance blesses those that are prepared to be involved in God's story. Huge encouragement to us. Most of us don't swing from one great theophany to another, but our lives proceed relatively understated. This is no less spiritual. God is still guiding. He is in the ordinariness of our lives and his hand is outstretched to bless and guide us. The third aspect of the story that we need to reflect on is God's redemption. The story of Judges reveals how the nation's unfaithfulness in failing to drive out the nations before them became a snare to them. These stories of ethnic cleansing can sit a little uncomfortable with our modern ears. Yet I hope as we've unpacked books like Leviticus, highlighted the warnings God has given in the books of Joshua and Judges, how seriously God takes holiness. What is at stake is covenant fulfilment. God's desire is that through them, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, God's people cannot be a blessing to the nations if they compromise their relationship in being unfaithful towards God. And they have to get rid of everything that would compromise this relationship. The glory of God is at stake and their witness to a watching world. And if we don't read these passages right, we could think that God is not truly for other people. As we read the story of Ruth though, we know that the nation of Israel were not to give their sons and daughters in marriage to other nations. It caused grumblings against Moses and his Cushite white in Numbers 12, and we read that Ruth is a Moabite. Though marriage was not forbidden, the law said, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. It's a law that seeks to express how serious people are to commit to holiness. Now the story of Ruth begins to show how this covenant be blessing begins to work out in practice. Ruth is an alien from a hated nation, yet she chooses to follow the one true God and through such a commitment becomes one of God's people and comes under his blessing. As such, she is able to love Naomi and is the means of God showing her great kindness and blessing towards subsequent generations. Through Ruth, the tears of bitterness turn to joy and the women of Bethlehem declare, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons. Someone who has two daughters or 14 sons, uh, I can recognize the benefit of daughters. Sorry for those of you who have sons. Only joking. As Ruth blesses Naomi, she too is blessed. She's chosen to come under the wings of Almighty God and his care and blessing enables her to have a family of her own. 
through a foreigner without the covenant history enjoyed by other people, she shows covenant love and loyalty in a way others have not. This is especially seen in the genealogy at the end. She becomes the means of redeeming all people and being a blessing to the whole world. God is for all people and uses the most unlikely and improbable to continue his redemption story. We recognise how important Ruth is as she's named in the genealogy of David and also of Jesus. Ruth, open and available to the covenant-keeping God, becomes the means of blessing the whole world. In many people's eyes, she may not have looked very probable, but God can use everyone who lives in covenant relationship with him through the redeeming power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pause for a moment and just give God space to stir in our hearts what he wants us to take away from the book of Ruth this evening.